This series is brought to you by the Heritage Office at Kilkenny County Council. Episode 4, Behind the Scenes. My name is Connor Sweetman and I am the co-producer of this series. And in this episode, I speak with Regina Fitzpatrick about working on the GAA Oral History Project. So the GAA Oral History Project, it was commissioned by the GAA as part of a series of initiatives to celebrate 125 years of the GAA, which took place in 2009. Essentially, the premise was that the GAA is is a grassroots organisation, that the history of the GAA is a people's history. And so they felt that in an organisation of volunteers, that the, the memories of ordinary people and supporters should be recorded alongside those, you know, inter-county players and senior administrators so that it would be right across the spectrum of involvement in the GAA. So this was a, a large scale, well-funded public history project. And so I suppose the challenge really was coming up with a design that could record long form oral history interviews of archival quality using the best methods available with as many people from as many perspectives as possible. So it was really quite a sort of a big brief because we really wanted to get that spread and that, um, you know, across the board, um, I suppose, account of what the place that the GAA held in people's lives. So the country was divided into 16 counties each between myself and Dr. Arlene Crampsey. And we spent about a month working on the interviews for each county. So we'd visit a county maybe for a week at a time. We'd stay there. We'd often record two or three interviews a day with people on their own or in group settings, traveling right across the breadth of a county into rural areas, down lanes, all of that. Um, and then after a week or so, we'd return to the office um, uh, to basically to document what we collected, to catalogue it, to archive it. And that included both the oral history recordings, but also material that we would collected along the way for the archive, which would, you know, often included old photographs or minute books or scrapbooks or, you know, um, various ephemera relating to the GAA that people were happy to donate to the archive and have made available to the public. I should say that we also recorded interviews with people involved in the GAA overseas as well. So Arlene recorded interviews in the United States. I recorded interviews across Great Britain. Uh, Both of us went over to mainland Europe and recorded interviews with people involved in clubs there. So it was really brilliant to get that sort of international experience and that diaspora experience of the GAA as well. There was also a schools element to the project and that was managed by Anne-Marie Smith and then by Ben Shorten. Um, And this involved engaging school children um, across the country in recording memories of older relatives and friends. Um, And so that was brilliant that, you know, schools were able to participate in this and what was collected there is also available in the archive today. And I suppose really the end result was a really large public history archive. It ended up being one of the largest oral history collections of any sports organisation in the world. And it's the complete collection is available now on GAA.ie. And then when we move on and start thinking about the process, like when you're actually going out to interview people, and maybe we'll just focus on one county. So tell me about the Kilkenny interviews. You know, what was it like on the ground when you were doing those you know, three interviews a day? Yeah, I suppose Kilkenny was always going to be slightly different because I'm from here. And I suppose I was more familiar. I was very familiar with the county. The, you know, the place names, the places were familiar. The clubs were familiar and the culture of it here was was very familiar to me. So Kilkenny was that bit different. Uh, but I suppose because I was able to do the odd interview here and there over weekends. We probably ended up with a, a quite a large Kilkenny collection <laughs> proportionately, um, I would say. Uh, but that being said, you know, I had, I, I met the majority of people that the vast majority of people I interviewed for the Kilkenny interviews I'd never met before. So we, I did go right around the county and, you know, in every county we were trying to get a representation of hurling, football, Ladies Gaelic football, camogie, handball, wherever we could. You know, I was trying to get a mix of like an urban experience, of a rural experience, which we did in every county. We tried to get, you know, 
um, the experiences from the different perspectives, like, you know, from school teachers to talk about what happened in schools, from maybe journalists who reported on the games, from players, from administrators. We tried to get kind of from members of the clergy sometimes, um, people who had a diverse experience and, and various different perspectives on the games. But it was lovely and it was nice. I think because I was from here then going in to do an interview with somebody in Kilkenny, you know, the, you know, obviously you're being interviewed as much as the person is because, you know, you're, you're going into somebody's home. And they're like, and where are you from? It's like, oh, I'm from Galmai. And then you find that common ground and everybody's at their ease and it makes for a very comfortable interview as well. You know, so that was nice. I think there was a lot we did right in this project um, and I think we used the best methods and advice available to us at the time. What I don't think we did successfully right across the project was to record enough women's voices. Um, ladies football and camogie weren't in the brief of the project, though we did include interviews from the women's games and about the women's games right in, in every every county we went to. Um, and there are fantastic interviews with women in the collection. The trouble is there aren't enough of them. Um, so at the time, I think the vast majority of people who came forward to be interviewed or were who, who were suggested to us to be interviewed were men. Um, and so I think if, if we were to do the project again, I think we'd work harder to generate a better balance in the collection of, mem of men's and, and women's voices. So from producing this series, one of the lines that always sticks out to me, it's so memorable, uh, was when Dan McAvoy declares, you know, it's a religion in Kilkenny. And of course, you, you probably knew that already, but when we're, when you're actually going around doing the interviews in yeah. Kilkenny, did you get more of a feeling of uh, the religious nature of the experience of hurling in Kilkenny? Absolutely. I think probably what struck me in Kilkenny is that you could go into any parish in Kilkenny and it was it was so important in every community. Like there were there was no strong parts of the county for it. Do you know what I mean? It was right across the county. Um, and I suppose I identified more with this because I'm from Kilkenny, but I, it was also very much the case in other counties that there's just a massive amount of um, passion there. And just when you listen to the um, the lengths that people have gone to, the time that they have put in, the commitment and dedication they have given to the games, whether that be in maintaining the field or as a senior player or administrator, I think that dedication kind of, it, it was never short of kind of awe-inspiring, like it was really very much to be felt. And I think, I suppose what you felt in Kilkenny very much is that it's just hurling is so tied up in the identity of the county. And it's just a, it's just a lovely thing to see that it's held such an interest and a love for people here. So we've talked separately about some of the experiences that you've had when you're out collecting interviews. Uh, you told me a great story about visiting Paddy Buggy's house. You spent a whole day there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Paddy Buggy was an extraordinary man. Um, and as People will know he was uh, the president of the GAA. He was the president of the GAA during the centenary of the GAA in 1984. He also played senior hurling for Kilkenny and played lots of roles in his club and Leinster Council, you know, you know, at a national level for many years. His passion for not just the GAA, but for all things Irish, just exuded from him and he was one of those people you interview and you felt like that he was just this really critical, you know, link in this chain of trans transmission from, you know, the Gaelic revival to present day. And there was a fire lit in front of us that was topped up, you know, very frequently. There was a roaring fire for the day and his lovely wife, Peggy, who um, just could not have shown me more hospitality and you could almost set your clock every hour. She would come in with another tray and it was a tray of sandwiches and tea. It was uh, fruitcake and tea. It was buns. It was biscuits. It was tart. And I'd say, you know, Peggy's priority wasn't, you know, 
maybe she'd heard a lot of Paddy's stories before, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, and I think her priority on that day was to take care of me. And so, you know, he might be in the middle of saying something and then Peggy would go, she, you're not, you're not drinking your tea. What, have a sandwich, you're not eating your sandwiches. And at one point, I think Paddy just turned around and said, would you leave her alone? She's watching her figure. <laughs> and she'd get sort of like, so you just, I'd like that. I was well fed going around the country. But um, yeah, that was a particularly amazing day. Uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed interviewing Paddy. So let's talk about this audio series that we're producing and that people are listening to right now. How did that all come about? So the Heritage Officer at Kilkenny County Council Dervla Ledwidge knew that I had been involved in the GAA Oral History Project and that I had done, um, you know, a lot of the Kilkenny interviews as part of that. So she approached me to see if there was something that we could do to showcase the Kilkenny collection in that archive. So I was really delighted um, to be asked to do that. Um, I suppose it's 10 years now since the project finished. So it was just a really good opportunity to listen back to the interviews, which I hadn't listened back to very much in the intervening time. And to really hear, I suppose, with the benefit of some distance, what they tell us about the place of hurling in Kilkenny life. And also to reflect on that process of collecting the interviews in Kilkenny. Um, so at that point, I got in touch with yourself, Connor, and um, to help me to produce the the mini podcast series. And the GAA archive also very kindly gave us permission to use clips from the collection and interviewees and their families were also happy for us to, you know, have their voices featured in this series. Um, so we're really delighted to have been able to have the opportunity to do this. So we basically divided the series into four episodes. Um, and what we wanted to do was to reflect the prominent themes that emerged in the Kilkenny interviews. Um, so we have an episode about hurling in school life, an episode about traveling to matches, um, and also one about uh, people talking about their heroes of hurling in Kilkenny. Um, and then we added this episode, the behind the scenes episode, just to give people some context, um, you know, about the collection and about the, the process um, of collecting these interviews. Um, so hopefully people will enjoy them as much as I did and see the value in the collection and that it's a wonderful repository of the story of the GAA, you know, in its 125 years of history up until that point. But what it also is, is a really I think a really important social history archive. I, th I think, you know, what you'll find in this collection is accounts of what childhood was like in Ireland in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, right up to the 2010s. What you'll find is what it was like to access, you know, media and the games from the 1910s right up to the 1920s. I mean, we have people from the 19 recorded from the 1950s who, you know, remember waiting three weeks for a letter to arrive in America to find out the results of a match to like people sitting in New York live streaming a match as it's happening in the 2010s. So like you have, it, it shows the gamut, everything from cycling hours to a match to people flying over to London to play a match, you know, nowadays. So it's everything from like a history of working life, of school life, of family life, of community life, of media, of the place of women in Irish society, of the place of, you know, the Catholic Church in Irish society. A collection is always of its time, but I think equally this has a, it's, I think it's a really lovely social history collection that would be of interest, not just to kind of sports historians or sports enthusiasts, but anybody with an interest in what life was like in 20th century Ireland or what life was like for Irish people who emigrated from Ireland in the 20th century. Our thanks to the GAA Museum and Archive for permission to share excerpts from the collection, which is available in full at gaa.ie. This episode was produced by Connor Sweetman and Regina Fitzpatrick. This series is brought to you by the Heritage Office at Kilkenny County Council. <laughs>